Socio. How's it going? Oh, fine, fine. You, you sure you're all right? It's just, you know, you you kind of been in here a while now. Did I miss Christmas? So, what, what are you working on? I'm uh, comparing the first season of Superstore to season one of Westworld. Uh-huh. Almost there. I can see it. Yeah, he's lost it this time. Okay, I know it sounds like a stretch. At first glance, these are not apples and oranges. They're trains and kittens. One is a critically acclaimed drama meant to take the torch from Game of Thrones. The other is a sitcom based in a retail store. Yeah, the job that's usually handled is a one-joke punchline for supporting characters. Honestly, it's surprising that Superstore has been on for three seasons with the premise of How can I help you today? For that matter, Westworld's in the same boat. We're essentially watching the lives of people in the costumes at Disneyland and their bosses redirecting them throughout the park. How did this concept get to be an Emmy Award winning series? Oh, first link found! Neither idea seems worth divulging into for a whole series. Didn't even occur to me before. Let's dig further. Meet our arguably main characters, Dolores and Amy, the biggest cogs in their respective machines. Both have been around their environments for a long time, and people in the machinations of their systems acknowledge their longevity. Neither has paid any more respect for their additional time, either from peers or administrators, but it's still something mentioned for both. It's also hard for Dolores to be remembered by her co-workers because the nature of their condition is fleeting. She is what Westworld refers to as a host, an android programmed to perform a series of actions to best serve the customer, and as a daily routine is well established, she and her cohorts are reset every night to relive a new day free of any memories from the previous reboot. So comparably, Amy is in a bit of a better position, right? I stalk these glow stars every single year for the back to school sale. And then I take them down and I put up the Halloween inventory. And then Thanksgiving and Christmas and Valentine's Day and Easter and Fourth of July and then back to school again. It's a good job. But tomorrow is going to be just like today. And I know that because today is just like yesterday. Huh. Not so different after all. How her co-workers are compared to host temporary but very real experiences is not that greatly different. Amy has worked beside these people for over a decade, and some are still essentially strangers, despite the near-daily contact. This elucidates another facet that binds these shows together. The narrative is broken. Most series that run for years plan on long-term development for their cast, making sure that the audience will be hooked by the ensemble's chemistry and how they bond as years of history pass in real time. In Retail and Reset World, where homeostasis and consistency are the norm, this kind of development is nigh impossible, because a situation will largely never change. It's fair to say that both these scenarios are not ideal for bonding with co-workers, but to be fair, neither was created with that intent. One's made to sell an experience, and the other to sell products. Wait. Not just products. Cloud9 sells its own reality in the form of customer service. This plays into the idea of emotional labor, a concept introduced by sociologist Arlie Horschild in her 1983 book The Managed Heart. She states that emotional labor occurs when employees introduce or suppress emotions in order to portray themselves in a certain light that, in turn, produces a wanted state of mind in another. That's not a new concept. Actors and con artists do it every day. But the following sentence augments the definition. This process is shaped often by institutions or other social structures. It's a concept modern businesses call brand building, where a company's face is managed by strictly controlling the individuals that participate with the public. It's not only vital for retail chains, but commercials, real estate agents, and even YouTube channels. For example, you wouldn't open a video of mine if my delivery and general demeanor didn't fall within my established brand. I mean, I have to make at least one of these meta jokes each year. It's mandated in my imaginary contract. Retail stores that want to survive in modern times must use emotional labor to control how their associates deliver customer service every day. This sells an experience, the only reason anyone in 2019 would venture out into a physical store. That or to try on shoes. This differs from the hosts in Westworld, whose entire existences can be rewritten at the drop of a hat. They're slaves to the manager class in their own universe. Socio, it's clear you haven't seen the second season yet. Not now, Dick. Sorry. It's been forever since I've been in one of these. Anyway, the experience stays consistent as long as the rules are followed strictly, and the customer knows they'll be getting their money's worth. 
That's another direct through line between these two. The paying customer. Westworld, for all its simulated violence and carnal distractions, is adult Disney World, aiming to create a once-in-a-lifetime experience no other can. It's also far easier for them to manage their guests' experiences, as the hosts are under more direct control. The head creator of the park is way more of a puppet master than the Cloud9 store manager. Huh. Perhaps there's more to evaluate in their varying styles. I'll bring in my expert in dissecting people psychologically. Wait, wait, Bacchus, Bacchus! The man's pointing an RPG at you! And you hold your light pole out like a baseball bat? Why? That's right, I'm going for a home run, yo. <laughs> I am so excited to see this fail. DM, I need your input on something. Uh, but that guess was about to blow himself up. He'll still be there when we're done. You ruined all my fun. I'm comparing Superstore to Westworld and- Ha, 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 ow, 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 that was ow, ow. What happened? Ha. Oh, do you specifically choose these comparisons to give me whiplash? This time that's actually helpful. Please illuminate the differences between the park creator in Westworld and the store manager of Cloud9. There is no comparison. I mean, think about it. One is an all-knowing god, all-powerful, all-feared, and the other is just some idiot who's been given... power. That sounds like pondering. You're pondering, aren't you? Well, they are both classic cases of DMs playing characters in their own session in the worst case scenario. I knew you'd come through. Elaborate for me. Ladies and gentlemen, we've stumbled upon one of the rarest beasts of all. Two completely incomparable shows have fused together to form one of the greatest mistakes of all time. So, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I present to you Robert Ford and Glenn Sturgis. One is played by an Academy Award winning actor, the other by a kid in the hall. One exudes control and finesse in all his words and actions. The other convinces you that he's the chicken lady. But these two men allow us to showcase two sides of a coin that is a fatal flaw of many campaigns. Let's begin with the most common offense. The DM's will be done character. Now, this is a classic thing that most DM's do. I mean, sure, they tell themselves that, oh, this character is just there to balance it, or to keep things moving along. Here's how it plays out. You make a tech, a paladin, a scout, you know, whatever you need to fill a hole that while providing some guidance to, you know, just pull the story forward. But that's when your players begin to notice that the plot progresses without them. And so there's no need to search for plot threads or look for valuable NPCs. And they just stop looking all together. Coasting along with the DM-controlled player for the ride. So, all right, fine, let's do it. Where are we going next, DM? At first, young game masters are happy to see their story progressing. They think to themselves, well, I don't know what other DMs are complaining about. My story's flowing along nicely. All the while, slowly building up the biggest opponent to their campaign and world in general. The neglect of the player. A uh, question? Yes, Flois Interruptus? How does this relate to Robert Ford? Well, let's take a look. He plays the humble keeper of the park, making a tweak here, manipulate the code there, but showing no more power than he needs to. It's not until push comes to shove that this park's creator starts to seem far more than human. And even the season finale plays out exactly like he predicts. He's a man whose plot never goes off the rail because, well, honestly, it can't. I mean, he's going to be there every step, guiding it along, nurturing it and babying it and what have you. The players essentially just become set dressing at this point, and it seems kind of pointless to give them choice because, well, the choices are predetermined already. Yeah, that, that's pretty well Robert summed up. That's only half of the worst that can occur. We still have King Clown. He may have started off as a joke character, just an NPC that had a funny moment in the first session of a long-running game. And then maybe that punchline appears again in a later scene and gets another good reaction. Suddenly, you start showing up more and more, and comes sort of a running gag throughout the session. But then his roles get bigger and bigger and bigger, and really, he doesn't contribute anything to the plot. <laughs> that, that doesn't apply here. Glenn's the store manager. Yeah, a store manager that does this. Coming through! Oh! That doesn't count! So good! Yeah! Oh, yeah! Yes! In your faces! Your faces! <laughs> He's got all the authority, but let's face it. This idiot would never get this job. And then miraculously, the fool never seems to get punished. 
Whereas player characters are held accountable for the rules established by the DM, his own fool breaks every one of them. Every custom, every norm, and if possible, every taboo. All for the cheese factor! And strangely enough, not only avoids punishment for his outrageous acts, but <laughs> they can inexplicably save the day if the party is failing hard enough. Deus ex follis. God through the fool? It's more subtle until it isn't. It lulls the players into the same bad habits because, hey, the comedy character's just gonna come along and save them. And eventually what happens to it is, well, like with Robert Ford, why should the players care? And then the campaign just floats away into the ether. So while these men show two very different ways that leadership are handled, they both show abuses of power in this situation. No, actually this is just <laughs> one big coincidence. These DM characters have nothing in common. I'm, I'm, I'm making lemonade over here. Thanks for your candid opinion, DM. Whenever you want me to prove you wrong, <laughs> just give me a holler. No, oh, excuse me. <laughs> All right, Bacchus, so we'll say your target number is going to be <laughs> nine. <laughs> give me a roll. Ooh, let me reroll those tens. Oh, again. He's amazing. One more time. Woo! Just two that time. Amazing. God does love a fool, doesn't he? Well, we've established that both series have strangely similar environments aiming at the same goal, using its employees as pawns in a scheme so big none of them can see it. The correlations are pretty clear. But is that enough to say that these two shows run similar themes? I mean, I just compared what they do to what everyone in the modern business world does. It's not bad, but hardly radical. I, I just know there has to be another avenue to explore in this. <laughs> I believe I can play devil's advocate here. Oh, storyteller. Where are you? DM put me in timeout. Apparently, there's something wrong with being a Decker in Shadowrun during December 2064. <laughs> Although, admittedly, it was worth it to see that vein pulse in his head every time I tried to jack in. <laughs> I'm so lost right now. I know. So then, you need something else to link these two polar opposites together, don't you? They're not so radically different. They both feature the destruction of the delusion of the middle class. What? Please, try to keep up. Westworld is a theme park that caters only to the super rich. And those that maintain the hosts are literal slaves to the world in which they work. <laughs> The all-powerful authorities knows the entire endgame, while keeping even those in the middle management positions blind to the real purpose of his park. It's ultimately two classes. The haves being catered to by the have-nots. <laughs> they desperately cling to this middle rug that they stand on, <laughs> only to have the rug pulled out from underneath them when the host game turns a bit deadly. I've never considered that. It does really paint the middle class as just an artificial construct to keep the lower class complacent. But how does Superstore do this? Two clear ways for the customers and Jonah. The helpful staff at Cloud9 have one goal. Help their customers. However, no matter how engaged or apathetic the staff is, the customers all seem disinterested, self-centered, and largely apathetic to things not concerning their immediate needs. They live with the idea that they are middle class, but we see more and more they're just reactionary to the sales created by corporate. Seriously, watch this. Hmm. Nope, it's eight o'clock. Oh, oh, wait, uh, hold on, I just wanna move that. That's not in center, that should be in center. No. There's no way that all those people are getting married. Yet, because they see that there's a sale going on, they all flock and obey and buy what's being advertised. <laughs> really, it's how the corporations maintain control of almost every aspect of the consumer's life. We're not that simple. You know, at the gas station right now, there's a buy two, get one on Dr. Pepper. Like a mom.
off to a flame. Oh, oh, they're nearly out, but man, what a deal. Sure it was. So what were you going to tell me about Jonah? He shows his own misunderstanding of how these social classes work in his own unique way. Assumed immunity. See, because he went to business school and then just decided to drop out, he feels he can just coast along at the Cloud Nine, believing truly in his mind that he is better than everyone else at this menial job, not realizing that he is a dropout who works at a menial job. He's just on a break. Yeah. I bet that's what he says in the mirror every morning. Some days he probably believes it too. He's willingly given up the race to increase his status and income because he believes he'll always be smarter and better than those surrounding him. Hm. A trap spoiled middle class children often fall into when they become adults. Okay, so he's in denial about his position shift. How does that disprove middle class? Meanwhile, his friends and colleagues that actually, you know, graduated from that fancy business school that he dropped out of? <laughs> They're going on to actually manage the corporations, to shape and influence the consumer markets to their desires. <laughs> and what's he doing? He's making sure that those visions become a reality, <laughs> at the store level. That denial obscures his view of objective reality. Is there much middle to that? <laughs> or are we simply in awe of the sharp slope between running it and being run into the ground? It's very well observed, Storyteller. Thanks for once again making me feel uneasy about our whole society. No problem. The pleasure was all mine. Oh, by the way, if you see the DM, tell him I thought of my next character for his Star Wars campaign. A long Jedi! <laughs> Maybe they'll be able to make a cerebral hemorrhage again. Middle class commentary aside, there's plenty of similar themes to explore. However, with that denial bit, I think I've struck on these season's main theme. Escapism. Going back to the customers for this one. What is the purpose of going out shopping or to a theme park? Both involve standing in lines around strangers for long periods of time just to wait for some kind of excitement or distraction or special sale, usually buying products at higher prices you'd pay elsewhere or wouldn't buy it all if it weren't for the environment. So why do we still do it? Moments. Getting out of the mundane routines of everyday life, seeing new merchandise, posing with mascots outside of short but intense attractions, finding that perfect item at a surprisingly great price gives a euphoric rush, creating a concentrated reality experience, possibly turning a bad day around in an instant. Escaping reality has become an industry. It's actually been an evolution of tactics that are as old as the Sears catalog in the early 20th century, where people could flip through these magazines and dream of the clothing, appliances, or full-on houses on display. They let you see the life you could live for the right price. Likewise, Disneyland tried to achieve Walt's ideal of making magic real, again, for the right price. The paying customers have to buy into this for it to work, but part of every human wants to believe things that are too good to be true, however artificial the source is. It's the reason why institutions in retail and entertainment have grown throughout the 20th century and even thrive in the age of smartphones, where experiences and products are much more conveniently packaged. Escapism is not necessarily a bad thing until we forget to come back to reality. We see this in Westworld, where the technicians and regular customers have their lives defined by the park. But Cloud9 also has its own cult-like rituals for the employees. All right, I like this. When I say cloud, you say nine. Cloud nine. nine. Cloud nine. nine. When I say team, you say word. Team. Word. Team. Word. Are we cloud one? No. Are we cloud two? No. Are we cloud three? No. It looks insane for adults to be doing this, but I can tell you I've repeatedly performed a similar ritual for a retail employer. And what we thought of as team building was really social conditioning. What begins as a few moments of escape can become lifestyles, where customers and employees are reprogrammed to believe these previous luxury items like department stores and theme parks are necessary for modern life. Unavoidable expenses that are part of a fulfilling journey here on Earth. Amazing how it all stems from modern people's propensity to take a moment away from their everyday existence. Wow. I really did not expect this, but the similarities between these two shows are way more numerous than I thought. 
Sure, they take very different approaches on how their stories are told, but at the end of the day, the social messages of the customer-employee-owner dynamics are completely transferable between the first seasons of these series. Hosts and Cloud9 employees are essentially cogs in machines far out of their control, but customers see them as the faces of their respective brands. That's why corporations have pushed this model for their businesses creating the illusion of small-town mom-and-pop customer service on a larger scale. Getting people in the door and buying that experience suffocates smaller competition, eventually leaving them the only option in town. Let's call it the Amazon agenda. Superstore may not have the same sinister plots and deception woven into its story, but it is ultimately more terrifying than Westworld, as we've discovered there are way too many links to ignore, and many people work in their own version of Cloud9. I feel I understand both their social commentaries better now that I've contrasted their messages. Man, I was really wrong to think this comparison is outlandish. It's just been too long since I've done one of these. Wait. Did it get dark outside? What? Oh god, where did the other half of my set go? I need to go get it from the painters! I'm Socio, and I'm back. So then, hold still while old daddy storyteller helps you out linking these two polar opposites together. Bad touch! Bad touch! <laughs> I am an adult. <laughs> <laughs>